We're, we're playing this song, guys, from Maribon. You've never even heard of Billy Joel. <laughs> What's that? An iPhone three over there? <laughs> listen, listen to the words. It's about oh, pressure. Oh, that's why you're talking about this thing. Yeah, okay. It's about pressure, guys. Mm. You got any rap songs you could put on? <laughs> no. Well, we could do one for Eminem. Okay. We don't want too many expletives, though, right? Well, you Pressure! Oh my God! All right, let me close this door. Actually, one second. <laughs> All right, guys, we are live. We just started that off with "Pressure" by Billy Joel. I actually got to take my mom to Madison Square Garden last summer. We saw Billy Joel play, and Marabon never even heard of Billy Joel. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? <laughs> He's never even heard of the guy. Have you heard of that song, Maribon? Have you ever heard that song in your life? Uh, I don't recall. Oh my god, <laughs> this is so embarrassing! Like Billy Joel, one of the greatest songwriters ever in the history of rock and roll, and you don't yeah. even know who he is. I mean, like I said, I've heard the name. I just haven't really heard his songs that much, and um, yeah, I, what can I say? I'm just a product of whatever generation I'm in. I forget. <laughs> Guys, how old do you feel right now that he doesn't even know who Billy Joel is and never heard the song Pressure? This this is like don't answer so bad. Do you have um it playing in the background? I feel an echo going on. Is that me or you? Uh I don't I don't hear any echoes. Do you have um it playing in the background? I feel an echo. I can definitely hear that. Oh, you know what? Like right now when me and you are streaming on this platform, I don't hear an echo. It's only when you played on youtube uh that you hear it so like when i open up the youtube link then i heard an echo but right now just me and you on yeah. on this platform we're good yeah that's right yeah complain. yeah are you seeing the chat i see a lot of chat on uh on the the stream yeah the chatting is great people hey guys wow there's so many people here hey ali steve ed john rick mm -hmm. a lot of people this is awesome, man. Yeah, greetings to you all. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is great. Thank you guys for coming in. I definitely have the echo on my end. It's me. And let me know if you guys are hearing me. Yeah, Paul says pressure is so 1983. Um, right, Paul. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, I'm super excited to have Maribon uh, on, and he's with the Tennis files, but he does this thing called the Tennis Summit, which is amazing. This is the fourth year, okay? And just think about this. This is in the last couple of days. He has interviewed um, Paul Anacone, who is number 12 in the world, Coach Pete Sampras, Coach Roger Federer, works for the Tennis Channel, on Tennis Channel all the time. He's pretty much on 24-7 now. And uh, then after this, he's interviewing Rick Macy, who coached the Williams sisters, Andy Roddick, um, Maria Sharapova, Jennifer Capriotti, and who won the Australian Open? Maybe the only major we'll have played this year, Sophia Kennan. He there's there's a picture of Rick with her in a little um, tennis cart. It's pretty cool. So Maribon, welcome to the show. Appreciate you having me, Pete. Uh, I just got to say I've been really enjoying all of your live streams that you've been doing, and you've been bringing a lot of great content to the community. And I just can't say enough about you know all the great things that you're doing, and I really appreciate it. Very, very cool. Well, I'm happy to have you on. Guys, you can get a free ticket to the Tennis Summit uh, by just – you see it right there. It's right there on the screen. I also have it in the, in the, in the comment section and the description below. Uh, also on Facebook, if you're watching on Facebook, we also have it in the comment section. So you can just click that link, get yourself a free ticket. Maribon, what is it? What is this all about? If people are like, well, I don't know what the Tennis Summit is. If they've been living under a rock, what is it? Yeah, thanks for uh, asking about that. So uh, Tennis Summit is a passion project of mine. It's essentially an online tennis conference, and it's actually free to attend and watch all the videos. So I think that's pretty cool that everybody can check them out. And they're basically a, a mix of on-court lessons, presentations and interviews uh, with many of the best coaches that I could find. And there's, they're really, a lot of them are really the world's best. 
uh, in terms of a lot of the people that you mentioned, uh, like Paul Anacone and Rick Macy, and you, of course, Ian Westerman from Essential Tennis, Will Hamilton from Fuzzy Yellow Balls, and there's just so many others. There's uh, over 30 coaches, and we break it down into a strategy, actually two strategy days, a single strategy and double strategy, technique, fitness, and the mental game. So I try to cover uh, all the areas that you might need help in your game in. And so it's uh, completely free to sign up and to attend and everything and uh, watch the sessions for a limited time. There's also like a upgrade uh, ax or option for you to do if you want. Um, but yeah, it's a great event. It is a great event. You do an awesome job. And so you, you acquired all be, besides be, Maribon, by the way, is a very good player by in his own right. He played college tennis. He's probably what are you like a five Oh plus player? Would you say that's fair to say? Oh uh, yeah. If, uh, I'm five Oh rated player in, in USTA. Uh, yeah. And I played D one college and all that. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like he's just picking up a racket for the first time, guys. This guy can play. He's a baller himself, but he does. He collects the world's best coaches and does this, this summit, which is amazing. And you can get your free ticket. And what we're going to do today is a lot of what he's learned about the greatest coaches of all time, some of the Grand Slam champions, people who have coached Grand Slam champions. We're going to help you get rid of that inner choker. We all have the inner choker. I mean, everybody's got it there. I've, oh my gosh, the worst feeling when you choke, right? And and you feel that pressure. We're gonna teach you how to handle the pressure by the tips. First, I said it was seven tips to, to play better under pressure. You know, actually play better in your matches than practice. How cool would that be? But I've noticed here, you've added to the list. We're actually gonna go through nine. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure, Pete. I just try to deliver as much as I can. And, you know, I send you an initial uh, list and then I just thought about some more <laughs> this morning. So I just wanted to pack this in. Yeah, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I talked to James Blake. I got to <laughs> talk about that, former number four in the world. Why don't, we, why don't we talk about what you learned from James Blake? Why don't we start right there? Yeah, for sure. So with James, uh, what I really found uh, fascinating with him is he's such an amazing person in addition to a great tennis player. And he mentioned so uh, something that helped him be calm and confident during matches. And what that is, is something that I try to talk about a lot with you all too, which is developing a game plan. And, you know, you have to find out and figure out and then create a game plan that will enable you to be successful in your matches. And, and so what James did is before each match, he would sit down, whether that with his coach or by himself and think about what he had to do to be successful and then what the opponent might try to do to uh, counter that and, and themselves be successful. And, and then what James would have to do to respond to that. And then he would play out these scenarios in his mind uh, about what might happen, what he needs to do. And then by doing that before his matches, he felt a sense of calm in his own words uh, about the matches. And so he actually told me that he never got nervous using this process. Wow. And so I don't know if this will be the same for everybody in terms of never getting nervous. Um, but he said he never got nervous and that was, he attributed that to developing a game plan. And I know myself, uh, I've had this issue where, you know, sometimes I've just stumbled on the court without even thinking about what I was going to do. And you never really are successful like that because strategy can make such a huge difference in the match. You know, there's a lot of matches that we win or lose by just a couple points. There's a tiebreakers and imagine if you, took a little bit of time to think about constructing some of these points, uh, which would then lead to you actually winning a couple more points or even more. And then you would be winning a lot more uh, matches. And let's not forget that, you know, even the best of all time, the percentage of them winning points, it's something like 54% that joke of points won by Djokovic where he had his like best year of all time, you know? So hopefully that helps. <laughs> that, that helps a lot. It reminds me kind of like, you know, different aspects of my life. And I think everybody can relate to this. You know, James Blake saying, I wasn't nervous. Well, wh why was he nervous? Because he's basically saying, look, I'm doing, ev I'm, I'm approaching the match from every possible angle. What my plan is, what their counterattack would be, what I'm, how I'm going to handle that counterattack. Where when you go into anything, like let's just look into school, you know, you, how bad did you feel when you went into a test and you know you didn't do your homework, you know you didn't study for it. 
well, that's probably where you're, you're most nervous. You're, you're feeling really choky. You have, you're not sure if you're answering the question right. You're kind of like, I think this is right, but you don't know for sure, as opposed to when you studied your butt off, you go in, you're extremely confident, you know, like any te- any question they give me, there's no way they can come up with a question that I don't know. I say this inside and out. So that's what James is doing right there. And it also reminds me of something that John Newcomb used to do, who you, who um, he he's won, I think, 24, 25 grand slams. When you add up singles and doubles, you can look at a great match he played against Jimmy Connors at the Australian Open on YouTube. And, and what he said was, he used to go, especially at Wimbledon, he liked to go center court, sit in the box, and just look at the court. And he would play the entire match. He'd, he'd know who his opponent was, and he'd play the entire match in his head before the match. How cool is that? Love it. That's the way to do it. That's pretty yeah. much what uh, what James was doing. And uh, some people in the stream actually mentioned this about a uh, visualization like Colin did. It can be yeah. effective for many aspects of life, just like you just mentioned. Uh, and and yeah, I've got to say, like, just like you mentioned, uh, you know, there's some people who are have the amazing ability of being able to just wing it. But I, I'm not one of those people. Like, I feel like I need to be really prepared for things like even for this interview, like I was, you know, typing an outline and even putting sub points for myself, you know. Um, so it's, that's I'm the same with matches, as I'm sure a lot of you are, where we really uh, need to actually think about it. And then that'll really translate to us being successful on the court. Well, Maribon, I've dreamed of playing you in a match for like a year. And every night I go to sleep and I, I dream about how the match is going to be, what color clothes I'm going to wear, what you're going to be wearing. For some reason, you have sunglasses on. I don't know what that's all about. And I yeah, played out. Mm-hmm. I went seven, six in the third. On mm-hmm. uh, We're going to play co- college rules to where the lets count. And I hit the serve. It hits the net. It goes over, drops in. You can't get it. I win. You lose. That's sickening, Pete. But you know what? I want people to check out uh, Pete's <laughs> YouTube channel because he posted recently a picture of him. I don't know if that was a college match or what, but this guy is looking like he's like 18 years old, young stud there, lefty, uh, looking good, man. I look good in that picture. Yeah, go to go to my, I guess, my YouTube story or, or Instagram story. It's on there. I found it yesterday. And yeah, I looked at it and go, oh, man. Those were the days. Uh, <laughs> all right. So that was really good. What do you have for us next? Sure. So this is something that I talked about with Paul Anacone actually just a couple of days ago. Uh, I forget if it was might have been yesterday or maybe Thursday, but we were talking about, uh, you know, the troubles, obviously, that players have uh, getting nerves on the court. And this is a great session that I think you all should tune into as well, because the session on the summit will be about uh, the mental game with with Paul Anacone. There's there's about five or six of those, actually. And so what he said is something that also uh, a, a close by club uh, JTCC Junior Tennis Champions train uh, training center they have posted on their courts, which is trust in your training. And so one way to be really confident and and know that you're able to perform on the court is just flat out putting in the hard work and then trusting in that training. So as long as you're being intense out on the court and practicing what you need to practice in order to become successful, then when you're faced with these difficult situations, what a lot of players tell themselves is, I have been in this moment. Like also Dennis Kudla, who I've interviewed, a top 100 player, uh, he said the same thing. When you're in these tough situations, you think back to, I put in so many reps on this play. I put in so many reps, you know, in these uh, situations, and I know that I'm able to uh, be successful in this uh, situation. So you ter- turn that like ner- nervous energy almost into excitement about, you know, accomplishing what you've worked hard for uh, all those hundreds and thousands of hours on the court. So really it's all about, like Paul said, uh, you know, making sure that you practice hard with intensity and then that translates and then when you're on the court you just trust in how you've trained and that that sort of mentality really brings about the proper energy that you need to have in order to become successful on the court yeah i think that's huge i i I think that this can give you so much confidence is when you're working hard on the court you know how hard you've worked on the court and and it also kind of reminds me of um uh, something that Paul said, I got to interview him too for Tennis Con. And he said that uh, in his book, he talks a lot about the magician versus the technician, right? And so 
he would say that Sampras and Federer are both kind of magicians. They can just kind of do what they want with the ball. And he didn't say like they didn't work hard. They were hard workers, but they were always just kind of looking for the field. They'd go out to the practice court. Uh, John Newcomb, actually, interestingly enough, I know he was, I used him in the last tip, but it also he was kind of the same way where he said he didn't know how long he was going to warm up or practice. It's like once he felt the ball, he was good to go. Where somebody like a Rafael Nadal, you know, he's more of the technician. He's going to go out there. He's going to work. He's going to train and practice. And, and knowing that when he goes on the court, no one's going to outwork him. You know, I think for most of us, that approach is going to work better than being the magician. Because there's very few, there's a lot more technicians in the world to where you've got to work hard to get what you want than there are, you know, magicians. I, I was even listening to a, a really awesome uh, interview with Tom Brady. And Tom Brady basically it was bragging about how things didn't come easy to him. He didn't make his freshman football squad. He was, you know, the freshman squad, not, not just like a freshman. Oh, like Michael Jordan was kind of like upset. Like, Oh, I didn't make that. Remember, that's one of the most famous stories. Like, Oh, I didn't make the, the varsity team as a freshman. Uh, you know, Tom Brady said, well, I didn't make the freshman team as a freshman, <laughs> but it was that hard work. He said that he built that work ethic and the mindset. And, and he also talked about when he got to, um, I think he transferred from, from California to Mich Michigan. He had a mental coach who basically, he was there, he was frustrated. He's only getting like three reps in practice. He's like, this is BS, you know, I can't even show how good I am. And, the, and, that, and the, he had a mental coach who said, look, if you only get three reps, make them the best three reps you're ever going to get, because someday you'll get six reps and then another, and then they're going to give you 12 reps. And then finally you're going to end up with, with the 30 reps and the other people are going to be sitting the bench. And that's exactly what happened. So make the most of your opportunities. Maribon, this is really great so far. What's the next one? Sure. And uh, before I, I go on to the next one, if you don't mind, uh, is, so Gary said, the best advice I heard is practice like you play and play like you practice. If you try and do that always, pressure lessons when point or match is on. What do you think about that? I think that's exactly right. And, and, and one thing too, uh, with one thing that I like to train people to do, we're doing lots of seven day challenges. We're doing a 30 day challenge right now, but especially when we're on the court, I always have people measure how many you're making. Like if you're hitting a serve, you know, how many can you hit out wide in between cones out of 10, you know, um, having that data to fall back on versus going out and practicing and going, I'm practicing really, really hard and the ball feels really good off my racket right now. I, I think you're missing an ingredient there because if you're just like going out there and go, man, I'm hitting every day, it becomes a different animal to where all of a sudden it's like, okay, let's serve, let's keep score. You know, where, where, where are you making your shots? Where are you missing? If you don't know, like, you know, if you don't know, like, Hey, when I go cross court, I can hit eight out of 10 cross court in the boxed area. But then when I go down the line, I'm only making four out of 10. Like that's data you should know. So when you go out there and you play, you know, like on a big point, well, I'm going to make this shot four times out of 10. Maybe I should go with a shot. I make eight out of 10. So when you go to practice, just don't practice hard. Start setting up your own data points. Know what you can make, when you can make it, how you can make it. Exactly, Pete. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so the next tip that I have for you all, and this is a great tip that I – uh, picked up from uh, Jeff Greenwald, who has been on uh, some of my summits and also is a, a fantastic mental game expert. And so he talks about building physical routines in between points. So this is excellent because in general, routines bring a sense of familiarity. Um, so I like to do this, uh, you know, every single morning I have a routine during points. I have a routine. So an example of this is, you know, looking at your strings and uh, adjusting them uh, between every point. And so what that does is bring a sense of calm for you. And, uh, you know, no matter what environment you're in, you still, you have the same setup before your points and you see a lot of the top pros doing this like Nadal and, and Federer and they're all they all have their own built in uh, physical routines that then m translate uh, to mental success for you as well. So are, do you have any routines in between points yourself, Pete? Yeah, actually, one thing that's kind of interesting. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, you, I just had an instant flashback. Actually, the guy who I was in the picture with in that in that doubles match 
we were playing and coaching at Jeff Hartman's Tennis Academy, okay? And I pretty much would always beat this guy. His name was Rob. And then in all of a sudden, halfway through the summer, he started beating me, and I lost a lot of confidence. And the thing that changed it is, is Jeff said to me, he's like, you're just walking side to side. He's like, you, you, you don't, you're just rushing to lose, and you have no rituals. You're, you're not using any tools in between points. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a better player, so I should just be able to just win. And what's that going to do with it? But he, he got in my ear. He convinced me. He's like, you know, first of all, after the point, you should always get off of the line. Get, get off, get off, because 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 then your your mind never has a time to calm down and think and just settle in. If you're just always in the hot box there on the line, you're just burning yourself out, especially if things are not going well. So that'd be the first thing. He tell me get off the line, start walking around, and start looking around and relax. And and not that you're like spaced out looking around, but just give yourself a little mental break, even though you're still thinking about the match. And then the next thing I want you to do is I want you to go to your strings and start focusing on the strings. And in the beginning, you're just focusing on the strings. That's it. And then you start to transition into you know what's the next point about where are you going to serve? You know how do you think he's going to serve? And and I'm telling you, just that lesson, I can still remember today, I'm 47, I still remember that lesson. Why do I remember it? Because then it just changed like that. Then I started winning easy again, like 6-2 and scores like that that I was used to. Um, so that's a huge thing you just pointed out. Awesome, awesome. I'm glad to hear that, uh, Pete. And yeah, it's huge. So everybody, please try to think about uh, some between point routines that you can establish. I'm sure that many of you probably don't have one. So try it out, you know, one or two at least. And uh, let me know, let Pete and I know how that works for you in the future. Okay. So you're crushing yeah. so far. What's the next tip? Thank you, my friend. So I have a couple of uh, fun stories for you and you, you might've heard one or two of these before. Um, but, uh, so the concept, first of all, is to focus on the process, not the results. And, uh, as I, as I mentioned, uh, my very first college tennis match, uh, I was at the Cornell Invitational. So my team UMBC, we went to, uh, to Cornell, uh, you know, a bunch of cornfields everywhere, but we went to the indoor facility and then, uh, to give more detail than before I was playing actually a friend of mine who I, uh, beat routinely, actually a uh, good player, you know, but so I was playing against him. I think he was playing for Stony Brook university. And then I started sh off very strong with him. Like, like I usually had. And, uh, so I was up, uh, six, two, five, one. And I, there was, I even had a match point, believe it or not, where, uh, I hit an offensive approach and then, uh, he hit a very weak reply. And I'm pretty sure almost hundred percent sure that it bounced out and I still played it and I missed the shot, which should have been a put away. And then from there, I just I was thinking about how cool it would be to win my first college tennis match. And that's a huge mistake. So then immediately, you know, what what happens when you think about winning is you forget about the process. You forget about what you were doing that got you there. And you just think about, oh, I need to win this match. And you get really tight. And so I predictably lost that match, unfortunately. And then I was obviously very sad and walking off the court. And then my, my coach at the time, Keith Purrier, who is now the uh, head college tennis coach for uh, Navy women's tennis, he said, you've got to focus on the process, not the results. And that always has stuck with me. Um, whenever I get to a situation where I feel like I'm thinking too much about winning, I try to focus on the process and not the results. And uh, a, a positive story about this is uh, I had a combo 9-5 match a couple months ago, because unfortunately, USC leagues have been shut down for a little bit now. And my partner and I, we, we were in the third set tie break at 8-7. And, uh, it, you know, a, a lot of times uh, previous to, to that, you know, I, I would think about the score, get tight. And, and I said, no, I'm going to focus 100% with my partner on strategy. So we we got together. We talked about each point. Uh, I called an I left on the ad side when I was at the net and he was serving. Uh, I called an I right on uh, at nine seven on the deuce side, and both times I was able to pick off um, the opponent's returns. And that was because we were thinking about where the opponent was most likely to hit their returns, and we were thinking a hundred percent about 
the execution of the point and what we needed to do instead of thinking about winning. And it's normal for sure to think about winning. Uh, this is just like in meditation where it's normal to think about other thoughts that come in your head. But the key is to just you know, refocus and then think about what you need to actually do to become successful. And then the, the, you know, the winning product of that will just come naturally. That's good stuff. You, 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 I hate to say this, Maribon, you, you brought up a bad memory that I'm I'm being up five Oh against temple. Ooh. And so, I mean, and, and I can still feel it. So, I mean, you guys can probably relate to this. I remember, you know, Temple was pretty good, and I couldn't believe I was up 5-0, you know. So I was just so excited. I was like, oh, my God, this is, like, going so well. Like, I'm up 5-0. <laughs> and, then, and then all of a sudden, the excitement starts to go to dread, you know, because then all of a sudden it's 5-1. You're like, it's okay. I got this. Then 5-2, you start to get, like, a little nervous, like, am I blowing this now? I still got it. So like, I still got plenty. And all of a sudden it's like five, three. Now you're like, Oh my God, don't freaking lose this match. What are you doing? And then all of a sudden when it gets to five, four and five, five. And so the entire time it was not at all process based. It was just about the numbers and the score. And guess how that turned out for me? Not so, yeah. not so good. So very good advice. Dick Gould. Also, when I coached, um, I did a Nike Stanford camp for five weeks and Dick Gould, I heard him talking to the team and he was giving the team the same exact speech on you guys need to be focusing on the process and not the results. Like if you guys focus on the process, the results going to take care of themselves. Dick Gould, I think they have the most titles, don't they ever in the history of college tennis? I think you're right, Pete. I think you're right. And speaking of Dick Gould, um, I just want to interject for a second. And uh, Jeff Salzenstein, who I think we've we've heard this story before, but I, you know, when I interviewed him a couple of times, he mentioned that when he played Michael Chang, I forget the year, but it was at the U.S. Open, uh, fresh young lefty player, just like yourself. And uh, he, <laughs> yeah. And so he um, he actually was up a set against Michael Chang. Mm. And then what happened is he started thinking basically he felt like he had already won you know and so as soon as he thought about that about he, he felt like he already had reached his goal and then he lost and that was that's one of his big regrets and uh you know so that's again in another example of him you know somebody when they even you're playing well like pete was like jeff was if you start thinking about winning then you know it can just go out like that so yeah good stuff all right man I love it. I think people are loving it too. So many positive comments coming. Uh, so this is great. Brad, who sure. we love, he's in the 30 day challenge because it's great to hear this happens to others. It, there's not a person who's, if you picked yep. up a bracket and have, and have put in some time on the tennis court, it's happened to all of us. <laughs> you know, no one has yeah. this. So, um, you know, even the great Roger Federer, wasn't he up two sets to nothing against, um, was it uh, Songa at Wimbledon and he lost? He was up. Yeah, something like that. But yeah. It was either Songa or I know he lost to, didn't he lose to Kevin Anderson too? He had a couple of losses at Wimbledon, which is like his place. And he was up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the Novak match too, which is brutal for many. <laughs> the Novak match. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> What's the next one? What's Sorry, Pete. <laughs> What's the next one? <laughs> yeah, so this one, uh, I'm really happy to have Jorge Capistani on the summit this year. And so what he's going to be talking about uh, or actually showing you on court, which is very exciting, is five drills to help you play better under pressure. So obviously perfect for to talk about for this match. So related to that, I just want to really highly encourage you all uh, to raise your practice level intensity. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm sure many of us, you know, during practice, we're very loose and we're joking around and all that. And that's fine for a limited time. But if you notice some of the best, well, all of the best players in the world, they're intense during practice. And this really is able to, to translate to matches to where uh, there's not as much of a disparity because when you're practicing at a, a tense level, 
it's closer to your match level. So you're kind of already in that kind of zone that, you know, when you start playing, then click your intensity is on versus you're just chilling, relaxing in, in a practice match. And then all of a sudden a, a match comes and you're like, Oh gosh, this is a match now, you know? So I found that raising my practice level intensity really helps me perform better in matches. And I, I'm curious to hear what uh, you think, Pete. I always like to just be lazy. Just go wing it. Pete, you weren't supposed to tell them that. No, actually, <laughs> um, when I was 12 years old, that's when I, I was number one in the state. Wow. And, and and that was probably, believe it or not, that was probably one of the, I mean, I was always a hard worker. Um, Rick Mace even pointed that out. He's like, I can tell you, like, your hard work is in your wheelhouse. You, know, you need to learn how to relax. Um, so when you talk to Rick today, tell him I said, when you do your Zoom call, you need to work on five things. Number one, relax. Number two, relax. Anyway, um, but I had a coach to where I literally was afraid of the practice. And I would worry, like, is this going to, am I going to throw up in practice today? <laughs> and not that I recommend this for everybody, but then I remember I was interviewed by a local paper and the guy who we were number one and two, the, we, we were both at the same club and, and, and he was saying that matches were the hardest thing. And I thought, and I said, matches are the easy part. And the, why I thought why matches were the easy part was because I didn't have to work near as hard in and matches as I had to work in practice. I was afraid of practice matches. I looked forward to. So when you have that, you can, when you're more afraid to go to practice and play a match, good things can happen. Yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You you really build that confidence. I, I remember when I was getting these really tough lessons. Uh, you know, there was one coach who <laughs> he'd he'd always yell at me like your uh, feet never stop moving. You know, and he would like make my my water breaks like you know fifteen seconds or something like that. But I, I I felt confidence after that that you know what I'm getting trained at a really high level. I can hang with these these players who are at a high level too because I'm training just like they're training. So it's really huge. Yeah. And, and one thing I want to point out, guys, you should definitely go to tennis. If you have not got your free ticket, you should go to tennisfilesummit.com forward slash Pete. And I'll tell you what, you should actually buy the lifetime access pass. I'm just going to say that, you know, one thing, if I just get on my soapbox for a second. And it's and we're going to keep doing it because we like doing it, but but we give so much stuff away for free that sometimes I worry that it's actually undervalued and underappreciated. He just mentioned Jorge Capistani. As he mentioned Jorge Capistani, I thought of this one movie right now that's on Netflix. That everybody should watch. It's called Uncorked. And it's about this kid who grows up in this kind of poor community and his dad owns a barbecue uh, restaurant and his dad wants him to take over the business. And this kid wants to be a wine expert. He wants to be what's called a small yay, which I think since like the 1950s, there's only like 70 something in the world like that have passes. It's like an extremely hard wine certification you have to get. Jorge Capistani, and I'm telling, I'm just trying to make this comparison because it's absolutely pretty right on. He's a tennis small yay. He, he is a master professional which I'm telling you, you have to do a lot of freaking work. When I looked at what you have to do to become a master professional, I looked at all the certifications you have to do and everything you have to do. I'm like, forget it. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> it's a USPTA NPTR master professional. He's in his States. I think he's like in the hall of fame for coaching there. Like, and you get to just go to that website and get his, his lesson for free. But I'm telling you, that guy has put a lot of logged a lot of hours and knows a lot about tennis and has paid a lot of money out of his own pocket to get as good as he is. So this is when we say it's the best coaching on the planet, we're just not like throwing it out there like it just doesn't mean anything. You know, we're not saying these are the best coaches, like I'm the best singer in the world, and then the person can't sing. Like these people are amazing at what they do. All right, what's the next one? Yeah, thanks for that, Pete. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, so the next one is, it, you know, it takes a failure a lot of times to succeed. So what you really should do um, is to just play more 
tournaments, play more matches, just put yourself out there. Don't be afraid. I mean, I, I remember that, you know, before each tournament, I would just be so nervous and I would just, I, I wouldn't want to play. I would, I would actually, at, in some cases, you know, at some points in my career, uh, just hope that it would rain or something like that so that the match would be pushed off. But the more that you put yourself in these high pressure matches and situations, the better off you're going to be. And it's just a matter of like Paul Anacone was telling me a couple of days ago, you know, I asked him, I said, what, what is it in the mental game uh, portion of these players abilities that helps them to just perform so well under pressure? And he said, for most of these players, it's simply a matter of being in that environment over and over and over again. So think about, you know, if you play just like one or two tournaments a year, you're going to think to yourself, oh gosh, now it's tournament. But if you're playing a lot, you know, a lot more frequently, a tournament or two a month, then it's going to become more, uh, we're going to become like second nature to you almost. And so you're just going to be able to better deal with the situation. So I highly encourage all of you too, because I just love playing tournaments and matches because that's going to show how your real true game you know, when it counts, you know, maybe in practice, you're like hitting all these crazy shots, but then when you play in a match, you're going to actually go to what you know most of the time and 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 you're going to see what is how are people actually exploiting me maybe you know the best is when you when you play a player who's a higher level than you and then you know in a lot of cases we think oh we're we're great my game's fantastic you know and then all of a sudden you play the the top 5 player in your region and then they pick you apart and then that's the point where it helps you improve you you have to think like wow how did he beat me i thought that my game was complete and so uh anyways i, I might be go going off into a tangent but the tangent but the main thing here is to put yourself into more of these situations more frequently and you will do better because you'll know what you did last time what worked last time what didn't work last time how you can improve and uh, that's my advice for that point <sighs> that's good thanks you you get, you're getting all, I'm getting so nostalgic in this interview with you. Good. <laughs> but this reminds me of a great story to where there was this guy, his name was Mike. I'm not going to say his last name. At the club I was growing up, and if, if, if some of you are on and you know me, I grew up at Summers Point Racket Club. I wonder if Chris Nolan's watching this at uh, on Facebook. So anyway, this was one of the most memorable, memorable days in the club. Mike McCrory was a guy who tried to play on the challenger circuit. He owned a pro shop in the club. Nice guy, but he had a big ego. Okay. And he would always go out. He hit with this other guy, Eric, and they'd hit and they looked great and they'd be hitting. They never played, never played. They always hit and they always looked really good. Mike would always talk about how he's going to play this satellite and that satellite. Then, this guy, Tuan, who played matches all the time at the club, okay, this little guy, backboard of a player, for some reason they got into it and they challenged each other into a set where it was like for 50 bucks. And when you looked at Tuan's technique compared to Mike's technique, it wasn't even close. Like Mike looked really good. So the entire club is watching of course, Tuan beats him because Tuan played matches all the time. Tuan was match tough. Mike, all he ever did was go out and hit. He never played matches. So when the pressure got on and he's looking up, especially seeing the whole club is watching, he freaked out where Tuan knew how to win that match. And it was a crazy, crazy moment. I will never forget it. Okay. What's the next one? The next one. All right. So, um, I like to do this in between points and whenever I feel nervous. And I think somebody actually mentioned this uh, earlier in the comments section. And that's to just take a deep breath to slow down your heart rate. I, there's been a lot of moments and matches where you just feel your heart pounding. And, you know, this, this is a simple really tip, but take a deep breath, try to relax. And, and I find that doing this really helps me refocus on what I need to focus on, because if you're, if you're just, your heart rate is just too fast, then it's not going to work out for you too well. And you're going to be just too nervous. But by, but by taking a deep breath, you're going to really going to slow down that heart rate. Uh, is this something you do, Pete? Yeah, absolutely. Breathing is important. Um, you know, I've always talked about the importance of breathing and I've always defended grunters, you know, because 
lots of time it, it can be obnoxious. And and here's one thing about myself. I don't try and be a grunter, but I, I notice when I'm playing my best tennis, all of a sudden I'll be like embarrassed. I'll be like, whoa, you're like so loud right now. And I'm not even trying to be, but but what's happening there is I'm releasing all the tension into the tennis ball. You know, I'm not recommending you grunt. I'm not saying go practice grunting, but I'm saying, why do so many players do that? Why? Because they're breathing into the ball, you know, and, and if you're breathing in between points, that's another thing that keeps you loose. That's why you see pros kind of go like that. Um, so uh, that's super, super important is, is to, is to relax and breathe. You know, one thing that was interesting, you know, Monica Sellis, one of the best clutch players ever, you know, she would always release the tension into the ball. And one of the biggest chokes of all time was Yana Novotna. I think she was playing Steffi Graf at Wimbledon. Mm. And her. She should have won. And I remember watching that match. And I think I was a teenager or my early 20s. But I could visually see her, like, holding her breath in. Like, I noticed that as a player. I'm like, she, she can barely breathe out there. That's how nervous she got. So releasing that is huge. Another tip. Somebody asked, who is John Newcomb? John Newcomb you know, as a tennis hall of famer, go, go just do some research on him. You know, without John Newcomb, without Roy Emerson, without Rod Laver, there is no ATP tour. Like they literally made the ATP tour. So look up who John Newcomb is. And he said, if you can't smile, you're too nervous. And remember one of the biggest moments in tennis history, right before Roger Federer goes to serve, Novak Djokovic gets down and he smiles. And then what's he do? He cracks the biggest winner, one of the all-time great shots ever. So if you can't, that's their thing. If you're nervous, see if you can smile. And, and, and Newcomb says, if you can't smile, then you're too nervous. Exactly. Exactly. Pete, should I go on to the next one for you? I love that. All right. So I'm a big fan of this and there are a lot of apps out there now to help you get into this. And I like practicing meditation. And I did mention this very briefly at the top of the hour and so what this what this happens or helps you to do is to refocus. So when you're meditating, you know, negative thoughts, any thoughts uh, that you can think of might come into your head, but the instructor tells you to refocus on your breath. And that's really important and translates to the, to the tennis court because a lot of times when you're playing, there could be negative thoughts come in, you know, maybe you're going to double fault or you're going to miss this foreign approach, you know, but instead of fighting with it, you know, which is makes things worse, what you need to do is to just refocus again on the execution, on the game plan. And if you practice meditation, even as much as little as like five to 10 minutes a day, I can guarantee you that you will see positive results. And, you know, just to remember results don't come immediately, but I assure you that the results will come. And I'm, like I said, a huge fan of meditation. And I highly encourage you to check out apps like Calm or Headspace. Those are really great. And you can even meditate on your own without those apps, but I just find them useful. And so, like I said, uh, it, the practice of meditation will really help you to refocus from the negative into what you actually need to focus on to be successful. That is great stuff. So good. I know you have got to do an interview with Rick Macy, so I'm going to let you go right into the next one. What sure, else? Sure, sure. Oh, awesome. yeah. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, so this last one is has always helped me. And what I found is when I get nervous, the first thing that goes away from me is actually my footwork. So my feet slow down. I don't get to the ball, so I'm reaching for balls. I'm not getting into position because I'm thinking about winning or something else, you know, extraneous. And so when I tell myself, let's up that footwork intensely, let's move our, our feet, you know, that's when, uh, things kick back into gear. You know, I get the, the blood flowing again into the, all parts that I need to, to be functioning well. And so, uh, I find that this is a great trigger for me, uh, to just up my footwork intensity. And cause like I said, the first thing that goes for me is my feet. It may be different for you, but I think for a lot of you, it's the same. Uh, let me know if that's the case. And so, like I said, up, up your footwork intensity whenever you're feeling nerves and that, that should help a lot. Yeah. I always preach that. I think we all preach. And, we, and the thing is as coaches, why do we know this stuff so intimately it's because we've experienced it and we continue to experience it. You know, I mean, 
uh, I feel like coaching, I'm like right there. I, I feel like I'm doing really good with my students, uh, helping them a lot. I feel sharp. You know, if I were to go out and play a match today, I wouldn't feel sharp because why? I'm not, I'm not playing matches. You've got to, there is no free ride for anybody. And one of the things that happens is when you get nervous, your legs start to lock up, your body starts to lock up. So if you can focus moving around, I mean, notice the pros, how they do that. Uh, especially a lot of the female players, they seem to do it more than the men. I like this ritual where they'll be bouncing the ball before they serve. And they're also kind of like jogging their feet. I notice the women do that more for some reason than the men, but I think, and some men do it as well. But I think that that's a great one. Really focusing on the feet. Most people, they work the opposite way down their bodies when they're, when they're doing a diagnostic check on what the heck's going wrong out there. The first thing that everybody does is the last place where you touch tennis ball, which is your hand. Everybody hits a shot and then they're like looking at their hand, like what's wrong with you, right? The first place you should look every time is your feet. The answer is usually right there. It could be, I didn't split step. That's why I got off to a slow start or I hit my shot and I didn't get back, so I got stuck in no man's land. I, I wasn't balanced right before I hit. You know, uh, there's so many different little footwork flaws you can have that messes up the rhythm in your stroke, that messes up the spacing between you and the ball, that then makes you hit a bad shot. And then you're looking at your hand going, why did you miss that? It's, it's what you're doing down here. And these always have to be, this and this have to be moving together to where you're not thinking about it. You're just in the flow. And once you can move your feet, you get into a flow state. This is, if you want to play to where you're like in the zone, get great at footwork. That's then, you know, you're not ever going to be able to get in the zone every single day, you know, but you'll be able to do it more often. And one of the ways to kind of increase your chances is to get great with your feet. Because the more your feet move, you're not thinking, you're just in the flow state. And, and so it's so important. That's awesome, man. Is, was that, was that all the tips? We ran through them. That's amazing. Yeah, we, it, it is uh, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. One thing, did you notice what I figured out here? What, do you see how cool this is? Oh yes. That is so cool, man. Love it. So Paul says the position of your feet is so much more important than the shot placement. Absolutely. Uh, look at that. Correction boxer. I will analyze what went wrong throughout my game and try to make corrections. Ollie, who I absolutely love, Ollie. She, Ollie, she's part of the 30 day challenge. Awesome. Um, guys, so if you're in the 30 day challenge, let me know what you guys are thinking about. I'd like to see a comment and put it right up here. And who has their ticket to the tennis summit? Let me know. If you have your ticket to the tennis summit, let me know. And I want to be able to like highlight you up here. Uh, and let me know if you also have your lifetime access pass. Um, let's see. The, the, we'll see. Is anybody? We're not going to leave till at least we see a couple people. Ollie says, I do. So Ollie's super right. in tennis. She's got the 30 day challenge going and she's got your ticket to the tennis uh, summit. Let's okay. see. Got it, says Greg Allen. Bam. Okay. Very cool. Let's see. If we've got somebody else. Excellent session today, guys. Thank you. Study tent. That guy studies tennis. That's a pretty That's good right. comment. I have a ticket. Look at this. This is beautiful. Been in the zone, but couldn't reproduce. This will help me reinvest in the zone. Great. I think we got a question here. When the feet stop, the racket does one. Dun, dun. Okay. Not really a question. Um, Oh, you know what, uh, Pete? There was a question about the approach of the inner game of tennis. I'm yes. trying to remember who asked that, but just what are your general thoughts on on the approach in that book? What's well, the whole self one, self two, um, kind of like observing yourself, which which is becoming really popular now today, where where they call it mindfulness. So that guy was really ahead of his time. I think it's Tim Galloway. Yeah, and so it's just really. You know, rather than um, the self one, self two is rather than like always berating yourself and, and just being like kind of almost too close to the situation. It's the idea of you're like just observing what you're doing and you're not judging. You're just kind of going, oh, that's interesting that you chose to do that. And you can either just decide that was a good decision or maybe next time that person over there will hit down the line and see how that goes, you know? So it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting concept. What do you think about the, 
um, that book. I think it's an amazing book. I think you all should pick it up and read it if you haven't already. Um, yeah, can't say too much more about it, but it's 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 really good, really good stuff. One of the best. Yeah. Yeah. So Brad says, thanks for doing this. And Brad, thanks for being in our, Brad is sending me a video like every day in the 30 day challenge. Awesome. He's signed up for both of um, the 30 day challenge and uh, Maribond's tennis summit. So I love that. And um, so it's just great to see you guys so passionate. Many of you guys have noticed have been on all week with us. So um, if you want a ticket to the tennis summit, you can see right there, we've got the link right in the description. You can write that down, tennisfilesummit.com uh, forward slash Pete. Um, you can also go in the description below. You can go into the comments below, not in these um, chats, but in the comments below. And you can get yourself a free, free ticket. And, um, and then when you get in there, you have the choice where you can get you have the choice to get it, which I think is a great, great decision. I remember I bought yours last year. Do you remember that? I'm going to buy it again. Oh, thank you, Pete. I really appreciate it. And yeah, like Pete said, you know, we'd love for you to join the summit. And I think the all access pass is actually an amazing value because um, you can keep all the video lessons for, for life. So, and I think that's a great move because there's going to be a lot of great information in there, obviously from the world's best coaches. And so if you want to have your own library of, you know, whenever you're having issues on a particular stroke or strategy or, you know, fitness, you want to uh, create a workout for yourself, you can just go to that uh, particular lesson or group of lessons if you have the all access pass. And we've actually this year added transcriptions to the all access pass um, which we're generating for you and those will all be in there. So that's new. Um, having my team work hard on that and you also get all the audio sessions so you can list, listen to them anytime you want and some other bonuses, uh, implementation guide. So that's a great option um, if you really want to uh, have that library for yourself to, to improve. Yeah. One thing that uh, it kind of reminds me of as you were talking, talking about the library. I just watched a Netflix special with Bill Gates, which blew, you know, sometimes you watch stuff that kind of like re-sparks your energy and like you think you're doing a lot and you realize, oh my gosh, I could really be doing so much more than I am. I think like, oh, I'm, you know, doing so much. And then you realize, oh my God, I'm not doing anything. And then this guy makes you feel like that. And he is an avid learner. Like he um, does a couple of things that struck me he's got this library of all these books around. But the thing is, is this just not for show? You know, when you go to most people's places and they got the books, it's just there for show. He's actually reading these books. His, um, his secretary said when he goes on a trip, she packs his books up and he goes off and he will read 150 pages an hour. And then his friend said he retains like 90% of what he reads. And then he does these uh, weeks where he calls them learning weeks. And he basically goes off to a cabin, locks himself in and just reads on whatever he's really interested in at the time. And this guy is interested in like saving the world, literally, like he's in the sanitation and it's, uh, he, he almost had Ebola in, in not, not polio in, in Africa wow. um, eradicated. And then Boko Haram came in and just totally I don't want to go off on that. Anyway, the story was, though, that he is an avid, avid learner. And so sometimes you might be thinking like, well, I've got enough courses. I, I, you know, I know enough. And I can tell you just through being on this entire week, I get more and more ideas. Like with Maribon today, with what he has said, I'm like, oh, this is some really great stuff. And it just keeps the passion going. It keeps your mind sharp. You know, the more you're entrenched in something that you love, you're going to be better off. You know, the people who kind of go like, think about people who've been stuck at three, five for years. And especially one of the biggest frustrations that I get from people who come out to visit me is they'll say, yeah, all my friends, I know I'm at a three, five level, but none of them want to get better. All they want to do, because there can be something, you know, you can play too many matches to where you don't, you got to have a good mix of practice to where you're working on different stuff and matches. Lots of people like, all they want to ever do is just, uh, play matches or they'll just hit, but they don't want to work on anything. And so they're stuck at three, five for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, same serve, nothing changing. Cause they're like, well, I, I took, I got started with lessons. I don't need any more. You know, wherever you choose to stop, 
that's where you're going to finish. So whenever you're like, I, I've got enough courses, I'm done. I don't need this anymore. Well, okay, then you're done. You're finished. If you want to be finished, then be finished. If you want to keep going, keep growing. I got to end on that, Maribon. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, it, I've heard uh, even you, you've named uh, your your group before that, but you, you've got to be obsessed with something to be great at it. You know, you've got to be into it. You've got to be learning constantly and then applying what you've learned as well. Um, that's, that's key. So, uh, you, you need to really apply the concept of improving 1% each day. I say this a lot actually, but they've calculated it that if you were to improve yourself 1% each day for one year, you would be 37 times better than what you are at the very first day. So just think about that and think about how, uh, just working hard at your goal and being passionate and improving yourself. Uh, how much that can help you. And then, you know, when you improve your game and learn, uh, you're just going to enjoy your life more because we all love tennis and we all want to improve and be better players. And so you have the ability, ability to do that. Um, just find great resources like the summit, like pretty much everything that Pete creates and, and just study it and learn it and apply it and you'll be successful. Okay, well, we got to let you go off and interview Rick Macy, who I went and took a lesson from in Florida last year, and I got out a checkbook and paid $500 for the hour. So, yeah, you guys get to sign up for this for free. Okay, yeah, literally ask Rick for a lesson. He said, I can give you a lesson, it's 500 bucks. I said, When's your first opening? He told me, I rented a car, drove down there 10 hours, didn't even bat an eye. I wasn't thinking, Oh, am I gonna do this? It's like, I'm going to be on the court with frickin' Serena Williams and Venus Williams' coach and Rick Macy. And, and I mean, it was in, so many people would write me like, dude, I can't believe you paid 500. I would never pay $500 for a lesson. You know, oh, what a ripoff. All that. I'm like, the guy frickin' coached Venus and Serena. He developed Jennifer Capriati. Like, see, I think the opposite. I'm like, what planet are you from? Like, if I can be on the court with that dude and get an hour of his time, I will never forget that. Never, ever forget that. And I bet you if you sign up for this tennis summit and you actually dive into it and you actually listen instead of just going, oh, I got it for free, so I'm not going to pay attention. Like if you dive in and you listen to what everybody says, you will never forget it. And you're like, I'm so glad I did it. That's right. right. That's right. My favorite lesson that I've had was when I've paid the most, actually, you know, like over a hundred bucks. I, those are the lessons that I remember and, and where I was most intense. You know, when I had those lessons, I found myself like writing notes, you know, before and at, well, after mainly about what I learned, you know? Um, so, so a lot of times, you know, when you in, actually invest then that'll up the intensity as well. So yeah, yeah, great point. One more, one more thing. And then I'll let you go just on this concept. Okay. Cause I think this is also a big part of learning. Um, one of the most successful online businesses in the world right now is, is click funnels. Okay. It's where you can basically, whatever your dream is, whatever your passion is, you can basically use this uh, platform to build websites and, and payment systems and lots of different things you can do easily. And, and the guy who runs it also likes to teach a lot. His name's Russell Brunson. And he said one of the earliest lessons he got was from his wrestling coach. His wrestling coach told Russell that you need to read this one book and Russell thought, OK, well, give me the book, you know, because he was just a high school kid. He didn't really have access to money. And and the coach said, no, you got to pay for it. And Russell says, well, can't you just give me the book? It's right there. It's like, no, you got to pay for the book. And Russell's like, well, why? Why won't you just give it to me? You want me to read it? I'm in high school. And the coach said, because you're not going to value it until you buy it. He's like, if I just give it to you for free, you're just probably not even going to do anything with it. He's like, but if I make you pay for it you know, work for it a little bit where you got to go work out, make some money and then come back to me and give me the money. You'll probably read it and then maybe you'll get something out of it. And this is a guy that if you know who Tony Robbins is, Anthony Robbins is like a big motivational speaker. I can see that Anthony Robbins is in awe of this guy with what he does with work. Like Russell Brunson's an inspiration to Anthony Robbins, whose job is to inspire people. So, and, and that was one of the best lessons that I've heard him say like 50 times. That's why I don't hesitate to pay for things because I realize it's going to make me better if I do it versus right. thinking I don't need it. Yeah. Great thinking. Okay. Off, buddy. Off you go. 
Th thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you joining, and huge thanks to Pete. Uh, you're w one of the best in the game, uh, great friend, and I really do appreciate as we, you know, all of us appreciate everything you're doing. And thank you all for joining. I hope that the tips helped you a lot, and and we will see you at the summit. Pick up pick up your uh, ticket uh, at the link below the video here, and uh, all the best, y'all. Stay safe and have a great weekend, and see you soon. See ya.